I'm going to start there in Matthew 5, but I call it the double blessing of the Beatitudes because I have another blessing of the Beatitude to share with you today that I, I'm guessing you may not be aware of, but we'll see. Chapter 5 says, But seeing the crowds, Matthew 5, he, Yeshua, went up into the mountain, and seating himself, his disciples came near to him, not that far from us, right over here out the window. And opening his mouth, he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of the heavens. Blessed are the ones mourning, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see Yahweh. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of Yahweh. Blessed are they who have been persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they shall curse you and persecute you, and shall say every evil word against you, lying on account of me. Rejoice and leap for joy, for your reward is great in heaven. For in this way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So we've been going over here the last couple of months, going over all of these Beatitudes. I think we did a pretty good uh, job you know, concerning that. But the first thing I want to go over is that when you look at the Beatitudes, they're not something that was revolutionary when Yeshua was given these. You know, in the first century, in literature and different things, the Beatitudes were something that were common. As a matter of fact, I want to read to you in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They have a whole scroll on the Beatitudes. This is from uh, text... 4Q525, this is coming from the Qumran scrolls, and it says, The blessing of the wise, blessed are those with a pure heart, and does not slander with his tongue. Blessed are those who adhere to his Torah, and do not adhere to perverted paths. Blessed are those who rejoice in her, and do not burst out in insane paths. Blessed are those who search for her with pure hands, and do not pursue her with a treacherous heart. Blessed is the man who obtains wisdom and walks in the law of the Most High and directs his heart to her ways and is constrained by her discipline and always takes pleasure in her punishments and does not forsake her in the hardship of wrongs and in the time of anguish does not abandon her and he does not loathe her. For he always thinks of her and in his distress he meditates on her and in all his life he thinks of her and places her in front of his eyes in order not to her. On paths. So again, that's in Qumran. In other Jewish literature, I'm going to read a beatitude from the Second Temple writing here uh, of Judaism. It says, O oh, blessed are those who love you, and blessed are those who shall rejoice over your peace. And blessed are all those who will grieve over all your blows, for they shall rejoice in you and see your glory forever. My spirit bless the Elohim, the great King. So again, there's many, many other Jewish writings that have this. So when Yeshua was coming here, this wasn't revolutionary. This wasn't something brand new that we're seeing in the Beatitudes that we're not seeing. One of the great things with Qumran is the fact that uh, only one-third of the Qumran scrolls are Bible scrolls. Every scroll is there they found so far except for Esther. But then they also have a third of the scrolls are community living, how they lived, what they did, and a third of the scrolls are commentary on the Bible. So there's some interesting things we find there of the culture. One of the big things that was found out since Qumran, it's not that far ago, you know, on the eve, the very eve that Israel is being voted to become a nation, is the same time that uh, the scrolls are released to the world. But we find out that the belief of believers in the first century is very similar. 
you know, with the Qumran sect. We have messages on that, which is interesting. So when Yeshua is coming here, why is he given these Beatitudes then? Because the, the, the thing that's a little different in the Matthew 5 Beatitudes is where when you look in the literature, the Jewish literature, including Qumran, what I just uh, read, it's more or less just physical blessings, just like in the Torah. You know, if you are obedient to my Torah, I'll give you rain in due season. I'll give you fruit on your trees. Where Yeshua now is here connecting it to eternal blessings. He's connecting it to the kingdom. He's connecting it, uh, you know, to the, like Andy went over, the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So it's not just that he's showing that if, you know, it's not just something physically you're going to get, but you're going to get eternal blessings, inheriting the earth, you know, uh, obtaining mercy, seeing Yahweh. So, so he's bringing it to a whole nother level. Now, we went over this, I think, in depth. I'm not going to go over it too much more today, because like I said, I have an additional blessing I want to share with you. We've been going over Revelation, and the book of Revelation, like we said, is filled with sevens. There's sevens everywhere, you know. Well, everywhere you look, there's a seven somewhere coming out. But did you know that there is a double blessing of Beatitudes, that there's seven Beatitudes in Revelation? So since we went over the Beatitudes already in Matthew, to pretty extent, today I want to go over the double blessing of the Beatitudes in Revelation. So what I'll do is I'll read them to you first, all seven, and then we'll take them one by one, and we'll break them down some. Revelation 1.3 Blessed is the one reading... And those hearing the words of this prophecy, and keeping the things having been written, for the time is near. Revelation 14 and verse 13. And I heard a voice out of heaven saying to me, Write, blessed are the dead, the ones dying in the master from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they shall rest from their labors, and their works follow with them. Revelation 16 and verse 15. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is the one watching and keeping his garments that he does not walk naked, and they may see his shame. Revelation 19 and verse 9, And he said to me, Write, Blessed are the ones having been called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said, These words of Yahweh are true. Revelation 20 and verse 6, Blessed and holy is the one having part in the first resurrection. The second death has no authority over these, but they will be priests of Yahweh and his Messiah, and will reign with him a thousand years. Revelation 22, 7. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is the one keeping the words of the prophecy of this book. And the seventh beatitude of Revelation, Revelation 22 and verse 14. Blessed are the ones doing his commandments, that their authority will be over the tree of life, and they may enter by the gates of the city. So I find it really interesting that, like I said, in the most of the uh, Jewish writings, where we see the beatitudes in the first century, I wouldn't say it's secular, because it's dealing with obedience to the Torah, but it's all physical blessings that are coming. Now, Yeshua takes it to another level when he shows that these blessings have more. But here in Revelation, this is the end of the book. So this is where we're showing that to the first fruits, there is a special blessing here that comes with being a first fruit. And as we're going to see today, I really think it's a double blessing. So let's start with the first one. Revelation 1.3 Blessed is the one reading and those hearing the words of the prophecy and keeping the things having been written for the time is near. So the blessing is coming for those reading and those hearing. We go to Isaiah 29. I'm going to start in verse 9. Isaiah 29 and verse 9. He says, wait and wonder, blind yourselves and be blind. They are drunk, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with liquor. For Yahweh has poured out on you the spirit of deep sleep, and has closed your eyes. He has covered the prophets and your heads, the seers. And the whole vision to you is like the words of a sealed book, which they give to the one knowing book, saying, please read this. Then he says, I am not able, for it is sealed. And the book is given to one who does not know books, saying, please read this. Then he says, I do not know books. And Yahweh says, because this people draws near to me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but its heart is far from me, and their fear of me is taught by the commands of men. So we see this here today in, in Israel with Judaism. You 
know, most of the ritualistic ways of looking at things. But the first blessing that's given here in Revelation is, bless it to the one reading. The one reading and the one that is able to hear. Because we see here, what is he talking about in Isaiah? He's talking about that here it is, the book is being given, and they're saying, it, it doesn't help me, I don't understand it. You go out today, why is there a thousand different doctrines? Why is there all this different chaos? Because they don't have this first blessing. They don't have the blessing of the one reading. And what a blessing. What a blessing we have. That our eyes are opened. And we understand the book. What a blessing that as you read, it's going in your ears and you're really understanding it. You're understanding what's happening. So isn't it interesting that's the very first blessing that comes is the blessing of knowing the book. Because what good would the book be? You know, like he says, look at Judaism. Judaism can read it in Hebrew. Right, back, forward, and backward. But they don't read books. They can't understand it. You know? So after all of, of reading it in the Hebrew and knowing all the words, at the end of the day, they don't even have the basis of salvation, as we were just saying. You know? So what a blessing. What a blessing it is that we're able to read and to hear. John 14 and verse 26. But the Redeemer, the Holy Spirit, whom my Father will send in my name, will teach you everything. And it will remind you of everything that I said to you. So this blessing of being able to read comes from the Holy Spirit. Because the Comforter, without the Holy Spirit, we couldn't understand. We would be one of the ones saying, when they, they give it to you, I don't understand it. I have it all the time with new people. New people that are just coming to the truth. And that's the first thing they say. We need a teacher. Like it says in, 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 in Romans, the 10th chapter. You know, that, well, how can we learn unless somebody teaches us? And how could he teach unless he sent? Blessed are the feet, bringing the good news of peace. So, here it is, without the Holy Spirit, you can't. You can't know it. You might know pieces of knowledge, that's more or less vanity, you know. It's only vanity where you get the worldly knowledge from these things. But if you really want to understand and get the blessing of this first beatitude of revelation, you have to have the Holy Spirit to be able to do that. Matthew 13 Matthew 13, and verse 9. The one having ears to hear, let him hear. Just like we said, blessed are those reading, and blessed are those hearing. And coming here, the disciples said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? If you ask most people in the world, why did Yeshua speak in parables? And you know what they'll always tell you? He spoke in parables to make it easier to understand. But look what he says, the very opposite. Why do you speak to them in parables? And answering, he said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But it is not given to those. For whoever has to him will be given, and he will have overabundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. Because of this I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, in hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. They're not able to read books. And the prophecy of Isaiah, which we just read, is fulfilled on them, which says, In hearing you will hear in no way understand, and seeing you will yet in no way perceive. For hardened is the heart of this people, and with their ears they are hard of hearing, and their eyes they are blinded, that they should not see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand in their heart, and return, and I heal them. Because again, what does it do? It leads to repentance. What good is the knowledge without a repentant heart? But your eyes are blessed. Again, your eyes are blessed. Blessed are the eyes, right, that see and the ears that hear. Because they see in your ears, because they hear. For truly I tell you that many prophets and righteous ones, we were just reading about them in Ezekiel 37, right, desired to see what you see and did not see and hear what you hear, but did not hear. Why not? It wasn't the time. You know, it wasn't the time. And we know there is a time. We were talking about it. Ezekiel 37, there is a time when these righteous people and these prophets will be resurrected and given their opportunity. But blessed, blessed are you, the first blessing, that you can actually read the book and it's not closed anymore. That you can understand it and that your ears can hear it. Revelation 2 and verse 11. says, the one who has an ear, 
hear what the Spirit says to the congregations. The one overcoming will not at all be heard by the second death. So the one that has an ear, hear. We know in the end time, the whole message is about repentance. The whole message is turning back to Yahweh. And the whole message is about overcoming and enduring to the end. So, blessed are we that we can read and we can hear. Alrighty. The second beatitude of Revelation, Revelation 14, 13. And I heard a voice out of heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead, the ones dying in the master from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they shall rest from their labors and their works shall follow them. So blessed are the dead. What a blessing it is, right? That we know we have eternal life in us. That we know that if we die today, it would be the blinking of an eye, we would be in Yahweh's kingdom. But to this world who doesn't have that hope, there's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of anxiety and people are fighting and nervous because they're trying to hold on to their physical life. If we go to Ecclesiastes 4, we see that it is a blessing at this time when things get so bad for Yahweh to actually allow us to sleep from our labors and wait for the resurrection. Ecclesiastes 4.1 says, So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun, and behold, the tears of those who were oppressed, and they had no comforter. And at the hand of those oppressed them was power, but there was no comforter to them. Exactly what's happening in the world today. And I commended the dead who had already died, more than the living who were alive until now. But better than both is he who has not yet been, who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. And like we said, all of those aborted babies, all of those miscarriages that will be resurrected at this time, you know, like I used to say years ago, you know, our friends in Texas, that they had a son, you know, and they brought their children up away from the, the world, and they were going to visit the grandmother, and they had to stop at the store to pick something up, and the, the father said to the boy, you know, so-and-so, you know, we got to stop at the mall to get this, and he said, Daddy, what's a mall? What's a mall? These children who grow up in the millennium with purity that won't know any of the evil, you know. So blessed will be the dead. Blessed if Yahweh gives us the opportunity. And that's why we're not holding on to this life. We're striving to overcome for the life that's coming. So that's the second blessing here. Blessing of the ones who die at that part. Dead are better than the living who see all the evil done by Satan through mankind. And the better yet are the ones, like I said, that haven't even been there. And why is that? Why is that? Because we have the hope of the resurrection. Because we have something that the other people don't have. We, we, we have eternal life dwelling in us. Hebrews, the ninth chapter, in verse 27. Hebrews 9, in verse 27, says, And it, as it is reserved to men once to die and after this judgment, so Messiah, having been once offered to bear the sin of many, Messiah shall appear a second time without our sins for the salvation of those who are waiting for him. See, to the world that's there that aren't repenting, they don't have this hope. But for the ones that have repented and we have his spirit dwelling within us, we're not waiting for him to come back and cleanse our sins. He's already done that. We're waiting for him to come back now and give us the reward. So, of course, it has to be belief in Yeshua first. But we've done that. We've entered eternal life. Eternal life is dwelling in us. Of course, if we're not faithful to the end, that eternal life can either be taken from us or we can quench it by being part of the world, by not keeping ourselves sanctified. We can quench His Spirit in us. But this is why, blessed are those who die. This is why we have no fear of death. Because we know with the blinking of an eye, as we die, we'll be raised with Him. 1 Corinthians 15, death has no power over the first fruits, And that's why it is a blessing, like it says. Blessed are those who die at this point. 1 Corinthians 15, I'm going to start in verse 49. And as we bore the image of the earthly man, we shall also bear the likeness of the heavenly one. Like we said, Yahweh said in Genesis 1, let us make man in our image after our likeness. We're made in his image. We have eyes, we have hands, we have legs and feet. But you have to grow into his likeness. 
you have to grow into his likeness. So as we bore the image of the earthly man, we shall also bear the likeness of the heavenly one. And I say this, brothers, that flesh and blood is not able to inherit the kingdom of Yahweh, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Blessed are those who die at this point. Why is it a blessing? Because until you die, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. You have to shed these mortal bodies to get the incorruptible, glorified body. Behold, I speak a mystery to you. We shall not all fall asleep, you know, be dead, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the blinking of the eye at the last trumpet, for a trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then will take place the word that has been written. Death was swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Hades, where is your victory? So that's why we see. Blessed are those who die at this point. There is no fear of death. Revelation 22 and verse 12. It says, And behold, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me to give each according to his work. And that's why the, the ones who are blessed here, that have finished their work in Yahweh, the ones that have been faithful, the ones that are overcame, you don't have to be tortured to the last minute. It's a blessing at this point that Yahweh allows you to sleep, and the next waking moment you're in his kingdom. Third beatitude of Revelation, Revelation 16 and verse 15. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is the one watching and keeping his garments, that he does not walk naked, and that he may see his shame. So what's interesting here is, in each beatitude, it is something that you have to do to receive the blessing. Okay, it's not just a random blessing. It's not like some of the things to Israel uh, where there are random blessings that Yahweh gives the nation or gives the land, you know, or blesses the people. But over here, as we're going to see, each of these seven blessings, there's something we have to do. So this third one here, which is an important one, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is the one watching and keeping his garments that he does not walk naked and they may see his shame. And like we said... The thief in the night, what it means is the in temple times, the priest that was working all night uh, before the holy day, particularly Yom Kippur, and he would have to stay up watching all night and guarding the sanctuary, and that's why he wouldn't even wear shoes to keep himself awake on the cold floor. But if he fell asleep, you know, in the sanctuary while he was on duty, then the high priest would come in in the night, and if he found him sleeping, he would literally light his garment on fire. And then the next day, everybody would see his shame because he didn't have his pure garment on. So if we go to 1 Thessalonians 5, we'll see a little bit about this. Blessed is the one watching and keeping his garment. Watching and keeping his garment. 1 Thessalonians 5. And he says, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write to you. But you yourselves know accurately that the day of Yahweh comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, like the travail to the woman with child, and not at all shall they escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then we should not sleep as the rest also do, but we should watch and be sober. For those sleeping sleep by night, and those having been drunk are drunk by night. But let us who are children of the day be alert, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet put on the hope of salvation. Because Yahweh has not appointed us to wrath, but the obtaining of salvation through our Master, Yeshua Messiah. And what happens? As the ones who are blessed to have eyes to see, we look around and we see it happening. We see all these things coming to pass. We see things the prophecies of the Bible all coming alive. But what happens if you try to tell somebody in the world, or someone you work with, what's the, what are they going to tell you? Oh, there's been earthquakes ever since the beginning of time. Oh, it's no, no different now than it's ever been. Oh, it's no more immoral now than it's been. You know, it was worse at this time. Because they don't have eyes to see. Because they're not watching. They're not watching. They're not watching, and they're not keeping their garments pure. And part of watching is, when you're watching and you're seeing such an immoral, vile, sick system, it's that we're coming out of it. 
that you can't be part of it, that it's so immorally disgusting to us that we can't partake of anything with it. And we see it. We see that this world in every way, as in the days of Noah, that where the earth was filled with violence and there's violence everywhere, and the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, making worldwide laws now for homosexuality and that it's a choice, you know, and that actually homosexual parents can raise children better than heterosexual parents. All of this evil, vile wickedness that Yahweh says is abominable, that is normal in society now. It's normal there. Because they're not watching. They're not watching and they don't know the time of their visitation. The world is watching the wrong things. They're watching Teen Idol or whatever those programs call it. They're watching all their reality TV shows. They're watching their R-rated movies. They're watching their pornography. They're watching. They're, everybody's watching something. The problem is they're watching the wrong things. They're not watching what Yeshua told us to do. To watch world events. To watch the times we're living in. To watch because he says, when you start to see these things happening, look up your salvation is near. And he told us it would all happen in one generation. So the people of Yahweh that are blessed to be watching, we have no doubt. It doesn't matter what Satan throws at us. It doesn't matter how he's going to try to put doubt in our life. We don't have doubt because we're watching. And we're seeing it. And we have the blessing of knowing how short the time is because we're physically seeing it. And it, it, it's appalling. I've said this before, that if the apostles and, and true believers of the first century were resurrected today... They would look at 90 to 95% of all types of Christians and Messianics as apostate. They would be shocked at what they would see, calling themselves the body of Messiah. They'd be shocked how people dress, what they wear, what they do. They'd be scared to death at all our little gadgets that we have. And they would consider 95% of believers to be apostate. And that's why it's important. You have to be watching. You have to be watching and keeping your garments pure. Mark 13. And I'll tell you a little bit of a litmus test. If there's anybody, because many people will watch this, if there's anybody that's doubting how close we are to the kingdom coming, then you're not wrong. You're affected by the law. Because any true first fruit at this point knows how close we are. They know it because the spirit of Yahweh is sharing that. And like I said, the proof of it is, just like, you know, it's not wrong to put a fleece out there. Gideon put a fleece out twice, and Yahweh honored it. But that's why Yahweh shows us. That's why Yahweh said there'll be signs in the heavens, and there'll be all these things that are happening, and He's giving us all these signs. You know, it's like the, the, the old joke years and years back. You know, the man that they, the, the, the flood was coming, and he said, no, 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 I'm going to have faith. You know, so they're telling him, no, but this flood is coming. No, I'm going to have faith. And what happens, you know, the flood comes up to the house, and he's going up on the third floor. And he says, no, I'm going to have faith. And then the lifeboat comes, and hey, Joe, come on, we're going to save you. No, I'm going to have faith. And then he goes up to the roof, and the helicopter's coming. We're going to save you. No, I'm going to have faith. And then he dies. And what happens on the resurrection? He says, yeah, what happened? I had faith in you. He says, Joe, I sent you two lifeboats and a helicopter. You know, you didn't have eyes to see. You have to be ready when Yahweh throws you a life raft. You've got to be ready to take it, but you have to have eyes to see, to know it's a life from Yahweh. So, Mark 13 and verse 29. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that it is near at the door. Be serious. Read the book of Revelation. These are seven Beatitudes in Revelation. And the last thing in Revelation says, Behold, I come quickly. Truly I say to you, not at all will this generation pass away until all these things occur. The heaven and the earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away, never. But concerning the day and the hour, no one knows. Not the angels, those in heaven, nor the Son, except the Father. He didn't say we don't know the month and the year. He said we don't know the day and the hour. Watch, be alert, and pray, for you do not know when is the time. So we see part of being alert, part of watching and keeping pure is prayer. We have to be constant in prayer, like Paul says. As a man going away, leaving his house and giving his slaves authority, and to each his work, and he commanded the doorkeeper that he be vigilant. Then you watch, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, at evening, at midnight, or a cock crowing, or a morning. 
so that he may not come suddenly and find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. Watch. And that's why we said we're not predicting. When we share things, hey, you know what? Look at these earthquakes. Look at these things happening. Look at these world events. We're sharing it because we're watching. And we're sharing with we're watching. So nobody here is predicting. We're not setting any dates to anything. But we're watching, and by his own word, we know that what we're seeing that the Father is giving us is showing us that the time is getting close. Ezekiel 9 and verse 4. Here's another reason why we have to watch. And Yahweh said to them, Pass through the midst of the city in the midst of Jerusalem, and imprint a mark on the foreheads of the men who are groaning and are mourning over the abominations that are done in the midst. See, when we're watching... And we're keeping our garments pure by watching. It's another thing to sanctify us away from all these evils that are there. Because how can you watch and not have it affect you? How can you be watching as this world is changing, you know? And all of these laws that they're making, even aborting babies now at full term, and seeing how it's getting more waxing and waxing, more wickedness. How could you watch and not, not sanctify yourself away from it? So... Again, another litmus test. How many times are you honestly sighing and crying and mourning as you're praying to Yahweh about the times we're living in? Does it, does it break your heart? Does it bring you to tears? How, how sad it is out there. How vile and how wicked. How many innocent children and people are being hurt all over the world? How many children are dying? How many families are being broken up? By what Satan is doing in these end times. Because those are the ones that are sealed. The ones that are sighing and mourning. Not the ones that are going along with the world. And doing the same things that the way the world does. There has to be a separation. Revelation 19. 7 and 8. So blessed are those watching. And keeping their garments. Revelation 19, 7 and 8. Let us rejoice and let us exalt and we will give glory to him because the marriage of the Lamb came and his wife prepared herself. And it was given to her that she be clothed in fine linen, pure and bright, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So again, by watching, you know, the first thing like we said, Yahweh enabled us to read the book. His Holy Spirit opened our eyes to be able to read the book and to have ears to hear. And then we see how horrible the thing is that it's even more blessed in these end times for the dead who died more than the living because of the abominations going on in the earth. And then blessed are those who are watching, but not just watching, watching the time so we can keep our garments pure. And we know it. We know it. It's written here. Everything that's written has got to come to him. And he says there's a point where... He's saying, blessed because the bride has made herself ready. And that brings us to the next beatitude here. One, two, three, the fourth one. Verse 9. And he said to me, write, blessed are the ones having been called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these words of Yahweh are true. So here's the fourth blessing. You know, like I said, these, any blessing of Yahweh is good. Any blessing of the Torah, you know, to make sure in every seventh, land, your, uh, seventh year you rest your land. You know, to make sure that you're, you're planting at the right time. These are all blessings because we want the most fruit. We want to be happy. But wow, blessed is he who is invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You can't get a better blessing than that. Blessed is he who is invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. But again, you've got to be keeping your garments white to be able to do this. Only those with white garments, as we just read, the ones who are keeping their garments pure, will be able to do this. Matthew 22. A very sober parable about this blessing. And answering Yeshua again spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is compared to a man, a king, who made a wedding feast for his son. And he sent his slaves to call those being invited to the wedding feast, but they did not desire to come. Again he sent other slaves, saying, Tell the ones invited, Behold, I have prepared my supper. My oxen and the fatlings are killed, and all things ready. 
come to the wedding feast and wow, meat they're having. This isn't a vegetarian wedding feast. You know, this is good old steak. But they sneered at it, and they went away, one to his field and one to his trading. And the rest, seizing his slaves, mocked and killed them. And hearing the king became angry and sending his armies, he destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, Indeed, the wedding supper is ready, but those invited who are not worthy. Then go into the exits of the highways and call to the wedding feast as many as you may find. And going into the highways, those slaves gathered all, as many as they found, both evil and good. And the wedding feast was filled with reclining guests. And the king coming in to look over those reclining, he saw a man there not having been dressed in a wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here not having a wedding garment? But he was speechless. And the king said to his servants, binding him hand and feet, take him away and throw him into the outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called and few are chosen. And what does this show? We know the parable of the, the wheat and the tares. We know that in the congregation, this is the hard part about being sanctified. Because... It's, it's, it's a proven fact. It's in there. I've went over this many times. The parables show it. That Yahweh has allowed Darnell tares to be within the wheat. And he does it for our purification. You know, he does it so that we will be purified by the baptism of fire. But it's there. So that's why you see, even at the wedding supper, you know, you have the good and the bad. You have people that are trying to overcome, people not. But, unless you've purified your garments, unless you make them white, you're not getting into that wedding supper. And that will be the scariest moment in any of our life, to be bound hand and foot and be thrown in the lake of fire as we see the other brethren going into the wedding supper. So again, we have to keep our garments pure. We have to keep our garments pure because blessed are those called to the marriage supper. Blessed are those called to the marriage supper. But like I said, each of these blessings, you have to do something to receive it. So it's not enough just to be called to it. You don't want to be the guy who's cold and thrown into outer darkness. You want to make sure you're coming there with a pure, beautiful white garment of righteousness and holiness. Matthew 25. We'll see another parable on this. Matthew 25. And I say with the times we're living in, being so serious, knowing that all of these parables, two will be taken, you know, two will be in the field, one will be taken, one will be left. It's always better to put yourself to err on the side of cautiousness in this and to be striving in all things as best as possible and not be looking at it. If we look at it from the point of, you know, he who thinks he stand, take heed lest he fall. If you think, oh, I'm doing pretty good, that's where Satan has you right where he wants you. If you want to be an overcoming, we have to endure until the end. There's never a point where you can think you've made it. You have to continuously be enduring because Satan is a roaring lion looking who he might devour. And the time he will devour us is when we let our guard down. And that's what we see here in Matthew 25. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be compared to ten virgins who taking their lamps went out to a meeting of the bridegroom and the bride. And five were wise and five were foolish. Those being foolish taking their lamps did not take oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels and with their lamps. But the bridegroom delaying all nodded and slept. And at midnight a cry occurred, Behold, the bridegroom comes. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins were aroused and prepared their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there not be enough for us and you, but rather go to those who sell and buy for yourself. But they going away to buy, the bridegroom came, and those ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. And afterwards, the rest of the virgins came also, saying, Master, Master, open to us. But answering, he said, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Therefore be alert, for you do not know the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man comes. So this is why we're watching, connected again with the watching, and we need, we can't keep putting it off. We need to be overcomers. You know, like I said, we have just about a month to Pesach, and we really have to make this the most important Pesach of our life. Because we... we We've talked about this for years, but we've, we've already turned the page at this turning point. You know, we see where things are going now. We see where the world is going, and it's, 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 it's a snowball rolling down a hill real quick and not going in a good direction. And there's a lot of things that could be changing very quickly, and we want to make sure that we go into this Passover not taking it lightly, that we're looking to be the best we can to overcome, because we don't want to be one of these 
these foolish. You know, like Yeshua said, if, if, if the person in the house knew when the thief was coming, he wouldn't have let him dug through. The same here. If the, the foolish virgins knew when the master was coming, they would have made sure they had oil. And that's the point. We, by keep putting it off, you don't know, and you're playing with Russian roulette. And it's a time where we have to fill our oil lamps now. We can't wait any longer. Luke 12. Luke 12, and verse 31. But seek the kingdom of Yahweh, and all these things will be added to you. We know at the end of the day, that's the, the most important thing, that not having all of these worldly ideas in our head of worldliness, the more worldly things in your life, no matter what it could be, worldly friends, worldly music, worldly TV, worldly anything, it's only going to separate you, and it's going to drain the oil out of your lamps. But seek ye first the kingdom. Every goal, every desire, every purpose, every prayer should all be centered around the kingdom. And if 90% of your prayers are just personal things toward what you want and what you don't have, then you know there's a problem. Most of our prayers doesn't mean we can't ask or share with Yahweh. He wants to hear our problems. But most of our prayers need to be centered around His kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom, and all these other things will be added to you. Stop being afraid, little flock, because your father was pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make for yourself purses that do not grow old, and a failing treasure in heaven where a thief cannot come near nor more to corrupt. And we saw this uh, in the other one. Yeshua comes as a thief in the night. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let your loins be girded about and your lamps burning, like we were just saying. You, 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 we all have to give ourselves litmus tests to see how much oil is burning in Bethlehem. And there's no greater time than Passover. And we want to make sure those lamps are abundantly filled over and even have extra, you know, uh, carry extra. It's like now, if we knew that this week that uh, all the gas would be shut off, maybe we'd buy extra gasoline, you know, so that we, we have extra. And that's what we want to do. Spiritually, we want to have extra, extra gallons of oil that we can tap into. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let your loins be girded about and your lips burning. And you be like men awaiting their master when he returns from the wedding ceremony. So that he coming and knocking, they will at once open to him. And we know the ancient wedding ceremony, what would happen when the bridegroom went out to prepare for the bride. And the bride was waiting and it would be somewhere around the year. Nobody knew exactly. But as that time was coming, that bride made sure that her light outside that house was burning bright so that when the bridegroom came he would know there's the light that's my bride we don't want our light being dim that he's not going to be able to see it blessed are those slaves here's another blessed blessed are those slaves whom the master will find when he comes to be awake and that's why we watch because by watching it keeps us awake and sober because of how close we're getting Truly I say to you that he will gird himself and will make them recline, and coming he will serve them. And if he comes in the second watch, or he comes in the third watch, and finds so, blessed are those slaves. But know this, that if the housemaster had known the hour where the thief was coming, he would have watched and would not allow his house to be dug through. And you then be ready, for in the moment you don't expect it, the Son of Man comes. He said, that's always one that baffled me, because I'm always expecting it. <laughs> But I'd rather always be expecting it instead of being like the ones in Peter. Where is the promise of his coming? They've been saying this since the fathers fell asleep. And I can tell you something. I'm 32 years in this walk. I came into the walk through a prophetic church. And from the day I came into the truth, it was always the end, the end, the end. Some of it they knew, some of it they didn't. But I can tell you one thing. 32 years in this walk, I've never seen things like I see today. I knew going back then, I knew we were somewhere close, but the circumstances 30 years ago were not like the circumstances you have today. And I'm telling you, the world will not last another generation. It will not. Yeshua said it, I believe it a thousand percent. He told us the sign of this being the last generation, and it is the last generation. And like I said, we're not setting dates, but knowing that, and when you see these things, look up, your salvation is close. Seeing the signs in the heavens, seeing all the things that He gives us, it, it's not to set dates, but it should be inspiring us to fill our lamps. The same way, like I said, if, if, if we knew the gas stations were going to close down, just like now with the banks, 
I'm sure if those people in Cyprus knew those banks were closing two weeks ago, they would have all went and got their money out beforehand. In America, you know, many hearing this will be in America, look out. <laughs> you know, I'd stash a little cash under your, your mattress because the same thing's coming worldwide and not that far down the line. But we don't want to be stockpiling money and physical things. We want to be stockpiling Yahweh's Spirit. We want to make sure that we have that overabundance of it, that the kingdom is first. And as these things happen, we're not going to have all this anxiety, but we're going to be looking up and praising Him. Because why? Because we're blessed because we see these things coming. Because we have His Spirit, because we're able to read books, because we're watching. We're watching for these things. And we're called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So as we see these things coming, we know we are one day closer to that marriage supper coming. How wonderful. Blessed are those called to the marriage supper. Are we anxiously expecting the bridegroom? If we're swayed by the cares of the world, we are not watching. We want to be anxiously expecting our bridegroom. The next blessing, Revelation 20 and verse 6. Blessed are those having part in the first resurrection. Blessed are those who have part in the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one having part in the first resurrection. The second death has no authority over these, but they will be priests of Yahweh and His Messiah and will reign with Him a thousand years. So it's interesting. Out of the seven blessings, we see four of the blessings come when Yeshua returns or after. And, and, and one of those, the fifth one, is that you die. <laughs> so there's not a whole lot of blessings of the Revelation Beatitudes that are really before, except that we know the book and we're watching. Those are the two most important things now. But all the other ones are blessings if we're doing that. They're blessings of the faithful. You know, called, chosen, faithful, like it says in Revelation 17. But here's the blessing, that if we are called, chosen, and faithful, if we are watching, if we are putting this first, we have the blessing of not only being called to the wedding supper of the Lamb, but we have the blessing of being a first fruit. We have a blessing of being in the first resurrection. If we go to Revelation 20, we read this last week, but I'll read it again, starting in verse 11. The white throne judgment, which comes a thousand years later. And I saw a great white throne, and the one sitting on it, whose face the earth and the heaven fled, and a place was not found in them. And I saw the dead, the small and the great, standing before Yahweh, and books were opened. And those are books of the Bible. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, all the things that we've ever done. And the dead were judged out of the things written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead in it, and death and the grave gave up the dead in them, and they were each judged according to their works. And death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire, this is the second death. And if anyone was not found having been written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So we certainly see, wow, that the better resurrection is over here in verse 4, chapter 20. And I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And the souls of the ones having been beheaded because of the witness of Yeshua... And because of the word of Yahweh, who had not worshipped the beast, nor its image, nor received the mark on their forehead and their hand, and they lived and reigned with Messiah a thousand years. So these are people that put nothing before Yahweh or his kingdom. There was no relationship. There was no physical uh, uh, desires. There was nothing physically that was going to come between their relationship with Yeshua. Even to the point of death. And they lived and reigned with him a thousand years. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one having part in the first resurrection. The second death has no authority over these. But there will be priests of Yahweh and of his Messiah and will reign with him a thousand years. We already read it with the, the resurrection. So here it is. The people that are, that are blessed to be part of this. They get glorified uh, bodies, glorified spirit beings. And they live and reign with Messiah for a thousand years. Revelation 1. In verse 4, it says, John to the seven congregations in Asia, grace to you and peace from the one who is and who was and who is coming, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Even from Yeshua Messiah, the faithful witness, the firstborn out of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him loving us and washing us from our sins by his blood. And he made us kings and priests to Yahweh, even his father, to him is the glory and the might forever and ever. Amen. Shall we see. Kings and priests. Revelation 5.10 says, And he made us kings and priests to our Elohim, and we shall reign on the earth. So this is the blessings now as they get better and better. You know, Blessed is he who 
takes part in the first resurrection. Because like we said, we've already had our sins forgiven. He's not coming back to the earth to forgive our sins. He's coming back for those waiting for Him for salvation. And what a great part to play. Living in this world now and seeing the wickedness. And like I said, if we are sighing and moaning and crying over these abominations, how great will it be when He gives us the power to go out in this world and change it. How wonderful will it be when we can go to Asia and Africa and these places and we could heal children that are dying of cholera and these other diseases. That we can get them clean water like that. That we'll have the ability to do all these things. But it's got to be our focus. It's got to be our focus. Is that our, the love in our life? Is it all based on the kingdom? Because like I said, we need that if we're going to accept these blessings. Romans 8 and verse 11. Because another reason why it's a blessing to be part of the first resurrection, you're a child of Yahweh. When you're in that first resurrection, not only does the second death have no power over you, but you are a literal child of Yahweh. Romans 8 and verse 11, he says, But if the spirit of the one having raised Yeshua from the dead dwells in you, the one having raised the Messiah from the dead will also make your mortal bodies live through the indwelling of his spirit in you. We just read it in Revelation 20. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the practices of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of Elohim, these are the children of Elohim. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery again to fear, but you received a spirit of sonship, in which we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself witnesses with our spirit that we are children of Yahweh. And if children also heirs, truly heirs of Elohim, and joined heirs of Messiah, if indeed we suffer together, that we may also be glorified together. So wow, like it says, kings and righteous ones would have wished to hear the things you heard. Because these things, unfortunately for them, are only written in the Brit HaVashah. You know, they're, not, they're not expounded on in, in the Tanakh. You know, and that's why it says it's the better covenant built on better promises. You know, because we have the promise not of only the resurrection, which they did have. We have the promise of literal sonship, which I don't believe they fully understood back then. The sixth blessing. Revelation 22 and verse 7. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is the one keeping the words of the prophecy of this book. Blessed is the one keeping the words of the prophecy of this book. Revelation 19 and verse 10 says, And I fell before his feet to worship him. But he said to me, Behold, stop, I am a fellow slave of yours and of your brothers, having the testimony of Yeshua, worship Yahweh. For the testimony of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy. So blessed are those keeping the words of the prophecy of this book. And the spirit of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy. You can't keep the words of this book unless you have the spirit of prophecy from Yeshua. And that's why he says it. The spirit of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy. And that's why it's a blessing to be able to understand the book of Revelation because you have to keep it to get the blessing. And here are seven blessings that are unbelievable blessings of eternal life that he gives to his first fruits. But we have to have that spirit of prophecy. And then Revelation 22 and verse 14. The seventh beatitude of Revelation. Blessed are the ones doing his commandments, that their authority will be over the tree of life, and that they may enter by the gates of the city. Like I said, many are called and few are chosen. We know to the Christian world, unfortunately for them, they don't believe in the commandments. They believe they're nailed to uh, a cross. But unfortunately, you can't get the blessing of the book if you don't believe in the commandments. That's why even Psalm 19, you know, when it says there is great reward in keeping these commandments. Everybody wants reward. You know, I don't think there's anybody in this world, even from a physical standpoint, who doesn't want reward. And that's why when you go to a job, maybe it's not the first thing you ask, but when you're negotiating somewhere along the line, you're going to say, what is my compensation? You want to know what your compensation is, because everything is based on, on trading, on compensation. So here part of the compensation of receiving these seven Beatitudes in Revelation is blessed those doing His commandments. I say it's not just believing in the commandments, it's doing them. Not the hearers of the law are justified before Yahweh, but the doers of the law. 
So shame on any of us that know the commandments and are not doing them. <laughs> you know, because like it says, better is to never have known them than to know them and not be doing them. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13 says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear the Elohim and keep his commandments, for this applies to every man. For literally in the Hebrew, this is what makes man whole. So that's what it's about. Blessed is he doing his commandments, because this is what's going to complete you. It's like, it's like a puzzle, or life is a puzzle. You ever do a puzzle, and you, you can't figure out, like, wow, it doesn't look like it's going to fit. And then all of a sudden, you get that one piece that you had sideways, and now it starts to fit. Well, this is the last piece of the puzzle, and when the puzzle is finished, what happens? You turn from immortal into immortality. So that's the last piece of the puzzle. It's Revelation 22 and verse 14. The end of the puzzle of our life is, blessed is he doing his commandments. Because this is what's leading into you turning into a glorified spirit being. It's what's completing you. And that's why it's the seventh blessing of the book of Revelation that's filled with sevenths. I believe 49 sevens. Then Matthew 19. Matthew 19 and verse 16. And remember when the man came to Yeshua and he says, And behold, coming near, he said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said, Why do you call me good? No one is good except one Yahweh. But if you desire to enter into life, keep the commandments. So here it is. It's the end of the book. It's the beginning of eternity. The thousand years are over now. It's going from this 7,000 year plan of, of, of time that Yahweh is bringing it into eternity. The new heavens and the new earth is coming down. And blessed are those who keep His commandments. Because those are the only ones that will enter eternity. The ones who keep His commandments. If you want to enter into life, eternal life, keep the commandments. Revelation 14. Revelation 14 and verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are the ones keeping the commandments of Yahweh and the faith of Yeshua. So we know Revelation is a book of the future. We know it's something that is probably already being unwound now as we see some of these things already coming apart. But we see that to the people of Yahweh, to the covenant people, they're keeping His commandments. They have the faith of Yeshua and are keeping the commandments. Let's go to Genesis 2. Verse 15, because we're coming full circle here now. Genesis 2 and verse 15 says, And Yahweh Elohim took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. So that was man's purpose, was to work the garden, to bear fruit, produce fruit, and to keep it, to make sure that it was in <coughs> order. And Yahweh Elohim commanded the man, saying, Eating you may eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you may not eat, for in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. So this is what started the whole problem. Man going his own way. And we see as we finish up in Revelation 22, the only thing that will give us this eternal life is full surrender to Yahweh. Full surrender to Yahweh, to his judicial order and everything that he puts in order. And like we said, with repentance, you destroy the path of the house. You leave nothing to go back to in your own life. It's a full surrender to your own. So I want to end up in Deuteronomy 29 and 30, the last two scriptures I will go into, to receive this blessing of keeping his commandments. And I will start in Deuteronomy 29 and verse 24, and then I'll read all of chapter 30. Deuteronomy 29 and verse 24. And all the nations shall say, Why has Yahweh done this to this land? For what is the heat of this great anger? Then they shall say, Because they have forsaken the covenant of Yahweh, the Elohim of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. For they went and served other gods and worshipped them, Elohim which they did not know, and who had not divided to them any portion. And the anger of Yahweh was kindled against this land to bring it on in all the curses that are written in this book. And Yahweh rooted them out of their land in anger and wrath and in great indignation and cast them into another land as it is this day. 
The secret things belong to Yahweh our Elohim, and the things revealed belong to us and our sons forever, that we may do all the works of this Torah. Chapter 30, And it shall be when all these things have come on you, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before you among all the nations where Yahweh your Elohim shall banish you. You shall bring these things back to your heart. And you shall turn back to Yahweh your Elohim and listen to his voice, according to all that I am commanding you today, you and your sons, with all your heart and with all your soul. Then Yahweh your Elohim will turn your captivity, and he will have pity on you when we return and gather you from all the nations where Yahweh your Elohim has scattered you. If you are cast out of the end of the heavens, Yahweh your Elohim shall gather you from there, and he shall take you from there. And Yahweh your Elohim shall bring you into the land which your fathers have possessed, and you shall inherit it. And he shall do good to you and multiply you above your fathers. And Yahweh your Elohim will circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed to love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. And Yahweh your Elohim will put all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you, who have persecuted you. And you shall return and obey the voice of Yahweh, and do all his commandments, which I am commanding you today. And Yahweh your Elohim will make you abundant in every work of your hand, in the fruit of your body, and in the fruit of your livestock, and in the fruit of your ground for good. For Yahweh will again rejoice over you for good, as he rejoiced over your fathers. For you shall listen to the voice of Yahweh your Elohim, to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in the book of this Torah. Remember the ones who are able to read books? That's part of the first blessing. Blessing, blessed are those who can read and hear. For this command which I am commanding you today. Ah, for you shall listen to the voice of Yahweh, verse 10, your Elohim, to keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in the book of this Torah. For you shall turn back toward Yahweh, your Elohim, with all your heart and with all your soul. For this command which I am commanding you today is not too wonderful for you, nor is it too far off. It is not in the heavens that you should say, Who will go up into the heavens for us and bring it to us, and cause us to hear it that we may do it? It is not beyond the sea that you should say, Who will cross over for us to the region beyond the sea and take it for us and cause us to hear it that we may do it? For the word is very near to you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may do it. Behold, I have put before you today life and good and death and evil, and that I am commanding you today to love Yahweh Elohim, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, and you shall live and multiply, and Yahweh your Elohim shall bless you in the land where you are going to possess it. But if you turn away your heart and you do not listen, you are impelled to even bow down to other gods and serve them. I have declared to you today that you shall certainly perish. You shall not belong your days in the land to which you are crossing the Jordan to go there and possess it. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have sent before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that you and your seed may live. To love Yahweh your Elohim, to listen to his voice, and to cleave to him. For he is your life and the length of your days, so that you may live in the land which Yahweh has sworn to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give it to them. So here he is, the seventh and the last blessing for the ones doing his Interesting enough, if you look up the word blessed in the Greek, the word is makarios, which means to be fortunate, to be well off, to be happy, to be supremely blessed. But we know the New Testament was not written in Greek, we know it was written in Aramaic. And in the Aramaic and Hebrew, the word for bless is barak, which literally means to kneel. To bless Elohim and to be blessed by him. So literally in the Hebrew and the Aramaic, the word is to kneel and to bless him and for him to bless you. Covenant relationship. It's reciprocal. And that's why I said over here, each of these seven blessings, the Beatitudes and Revelation, they're great blessings, but you have to do something to receive them. The blessing starts when we're on our knees. Praying and humbling ourselves before him. I want to read them one more time. Blessed is the one reading and those hearing the words of this prophecy and keeping the things having been written for the time is near. And I heard a voice out of heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead 
The ones dying in the master from now on, yes, says the Spirit, they shall rest from their labors and their works follow with them. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is the one watching and keeping his garments, that he does not walk naked, and they may see the shame. And he said to me, Write, Blessed are the ones having been called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These words of Yahweh are true. Blessed and holy is the one having part in the first resurrection. The second death has no authority over these, but they will be priests of Yahweh and his Messiah, and will reign with him a thousand years. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is the one keeping the words of the prophecy of this book. Blessed are the ones doing his commandments, that their authority will be over the tree of life, and they may enter by the gates of the city. So we see Adam and Eve choosing the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the day you eat this fruit, you'll die. But blessed are the ones who are choosing the tree of life. And it's literally taking the free will that he freely gives us and surrendering it down to his feet and saying, I don't want it. I see where free will went to. I see where free choice goes to. I don't want it. Here, Father, you take my free choice. I am unconditionally your servant and blessed by these things. These are the seven beatitudes of the double blessing of the first fruits. You have the eight beatitudes in Matthew. You have the seven beatitudes here. How truly blessed we are to have them and to understand them and to be so blessed by Yahweh.